They call this the blue hour, the hour after the sun has set. It's my favorite time to drive. I use it to do my big cross-state drive because I mostly dwell in Boston and the Berkshires. It kind of takes the edge off the monotony of it. It's very pretty. I just spent a week in Boston, the longest I've spent there in a long time. Had a doctor's appointment, caught up with some old friends, put in some overtime at work because I recently contracted Lyme disease, which affects my concentration. My kind of work is very detail-oriented. Anyway, I'm eager to get out of Boston, back to the mountains, and have a weekend full of adventure. So I said I wanted adventure this weekend, get my mind off work. I can't think of a better way to do that than searching for a bunch of dead bodies. <laughs> I'm at a place called the Bennington Triangle in Southern Vermont, where a half dozen people went missing in the 1940s. I have a couple of friends with me. This is Terry and Morgan. You may have seen them a few videos ago. They were just shadowy silhouettes and muffled voices. Today, you can see that they're actually real people. We are real. Yes. So we might not find the bodies today, but this is a great hike. Not sure how much elevation gain. There is a nice ledge there. Oh yeah. White rocks, yeah. I think. So Quartz crystals. Quartz crystals, some really cool stuff. It's a beautiful fall day. The first day of a three day weekend for me. So let's see what we find. Maybe Bennington Murals is organized. So we encountered this bare spot in the leaves right here. My friend Morgan seems to understand what this is all about. Why don't you explain? So this would be a uh, buck would come during rut when he's looking for his girlfriends. He would dig the leaves away, urinate on it, and then he would rub his face on the branches to get the scent from his glands. It's all, you know, all to entice a female to come around. And this is his calling card. And it's called a scrape. Scrape, yeah. Now you know. So no bodies yet, but we have found something interesting on the tree. A type of mushroom or something that has medicinal values. It looks like a lightning strike. That's what I thought this was. So what exactly is this? It's not a lightning strike. This is a parasitic growth it grows exclusively on birch trees, wherever there's a wound. It's called chaga, C-H-A-G-A. -A. Um, it looks kind of, like you said, it looks kind of like burnt charcoal. It's kind of orangey on the inside. It has tremendous medicinal properties. Uh, regulates your blood sugar, your mm. kidneys, your liver. Sounds like something, cognitive ability. something I need. Yeah. <laughs> All the people who went missing here disappeared in the five years after World War II. I don't know what happened, but it's a beautiful hike. It's called Glastonbury Mountain. The trees are starting to open up. You get a view of Bennington down below. Yeah, it's a beautiful fall day for this. I'm only about 100 feet from the summit. Can't wait to get there. This whole town is kind of spooky. It's called Glastonbury. It used to be a town. It got disincorporated, I think, in the late 30s due to a low population. Only two times that's ever happened in Vermont. Near the top of the peak here, and it kind of opens up into a very craggy, rocky ledge right here. Should have a spectacular view. Look at that. That's Route 7 in the center, and this is Bennington, Vermont. This whole beautiful valley below the foothills of the Green Mountains. On the left-hand side here, that big prominent peak is Mount Anthony, where there's a cave I just went to a few videos ago. It's a beautiful view, beautiful summit, kind of a spooky feel here in Glastonbury Mountain, which apparently is also known for its quartz deposits. Found quite a few while I'm up here. Very pretty, but it is getting chilly. I think it's time for me to start heading back down.
find dead bodies or lost gold to have a good time while hiking. Actually, that rarely happens, but today I went hiking with a couple of friends. Also something that rarely happens. I normally hike alone, and we got back down off that Glastonbury Mountain just 15 minutes before the sun set. I have more I wanted to do today. I need to do some shopping. Paper towels, I swear I go through a roll a day. Kitchen bags, always need some more of these. Dish soap, running low on this stuff. Thank God it's only 97 cents. Laundry detergent, Foca, no idea what this is, but it's only 250. Finally, cheap water again. I drink a gallon of water a day, something I didn't realize until I moved into a van. For the past week, I've been dwelling in Boston and I've been paying four bucks a pop for water at the convenience stores. Yeah, water is something that can really get you in van life if you're not careful. I also got something else while I was shopping in there. This is the kind of cable that goes from my power cord to my laptop. The one I had this morning started acting all wonky made me realize if that breaks, I have no backup. I can't use my laptop. I can't upload videos on YouTube. Yeah, it kind of gave me the heebie-jeebies. So if you're van dwelling and YouTubing, make sure you have backup electronics as well on top of all the van life stuff. As for now, I don't think I'm gonna sleep here at Walmart. I hate sleeping in big box stores. There's some options way out in the woods, kind of a bit of a drive, but I'm gonna try to get somewhere where no one should bother me. I am down a dirt road somewhere in Western Mass tonight. I don't even know the name of the town. No one should bother me out here. As soon as I go from Boston to the Berkshire Mountains, the temperature drops like 10 degrees, but so does my blood pressure. It's funny, when I first got the van, I was mostly living in Boston would only get out of there like every other weekend. Now I do the opposite. I've come to associate that city with stress and stuff. Maybe this is the Lyme disease talking. Yeah, I don't know. I don't like any conditions or drugs that affect my brain. When you live in a van, you need, you need to be alert a lot more often than when you live in a house. I feel like I've been com complaining a lot about van life. I hope it doesn't come across that way. I actually love living in a van. It's like the best thing I've ever done. And this weekend is a three day weekend. I just learned that like two minutes ago. I'm gonna celebrate it. Tomorrow I'm gonna have a great breakfast at my favorite place and go on a long adventure. Tonight, I'm gonna say, just so glad to be out of Boston. All right, talk to you guys in the morning. It is so foggy this morning, I cannot see 10 feet in front of me. I try to see symbolism in the weather. I don't know if this means today's adventure is gonna be a ton of fun or I'm gonna break my legs and die in a pit. So thankfully that fog lifted and I was treated to an awesome view driving to today's adventure location. I am back with my friends Morgan and Terry there are my tour guides. Once again, I basically followed their car to get here. <laughs> Today's adventure is an old lead mine called the Gates Mine, Yes, I think. Yeah. Abandoned, what, like 100 years ago? Yeah, I would say 100 years. About 100 years ago. Very hard to find. You can't find it on Google Maps. All I know, it's like a half mile from Susan B. Anthony's house. But it's a beautiful day. I think getting to where to park is the first part of the adventure. We have some walking to do. I think we have to go over like a brook or an abandoned bridge or something. Yeah. We'll figure that out. Let's get started. So there's an old carriage road to this mine because there's exactly one house that used to be here. The bridge to it kept washing out so often that they just stopped rebuilding it and that house is just left in ruins. I think we'll come across that soon. So look at this, there's a big bone on the ground here. What do you think that is, Morgan? I think that's probably a clavicle from probably a cow because there's so many dairy farms around, but could be a moose, I'd ah, like say. Awesome. So this is the old carriage road we're walking to the lead mine, but look at how precarious the ravine down here is. I don't think cameras do it justice. It goes right down 
hundred feet or so. So we're on the carriage road. There's a steep gorge right here. And what is this right here? So this is the original roadbed and an original dry laid stone bridge abutment, which is still standing a testament to its building and engineering. It's a beautiful thing. That's what this little thing that juts out is? Yeah, yeah all, all made of stone, hand laid stone. Look at this. This is crazy. You guys got to see how steep this gorge is. Oh yeah, you can see the other end. There's the other side. Believe it or not, there was a bridge over this. I'm gonna point the camera down very carefully. That's about a 50 foot drop. So this gorge is absolutely beautiful. I'm gonna try to get down to the bottom so we can get a better view of this beautiful stone bridge constructed sometime in the 1800s, washed out several times, rebuilt several times until they finally had enough. So there's a confluence of two brooks right here, one that cascades down this trench right here, and another one over my right shoulder, and they both meet right at the foot of this old bridge. So I think we just have to skip across. This is pretty slippery, so be careful if you're gonna do something like this. But this is the gorge that we have to follow up, bushwhack for a ways. So after we cross that stone bridge or whatever's left of it, the road continues up to the only house that was ever built here. It's been abandoned for I think 60 years at this point, but we're just coming across it now. Oh yeah, look at this. All right, it looks like we have some bushwhacking to do. Let's see, this shouldn't be too bad. Oh yeah, look at this. So most of this damage has just happened in the past decade or two, you yeah, think? So if you're coming here, watch out for nails. The construction here is kind of interesting. What is this, Morgan? So this would be a early 18s construction. Instead of post and beam, which has corner posts, typically eight by eight, 10 by 10, has planks. So they would run planks, two inch thick planks to full height and attach their sills for their individual floors of the house to the plank. So it's a uh, plank and beam construction. Interesting. Now, when this was occupied, all these trees must have been shorter. I'll try to show you guys the spectacular view they must have had. You can kind of see into a valley down below. It's all obstructed now, but this was a gorgeous piece of property. So I am trying to get around to the other side. Like I said, be careful about stepping on nails here. I can see them sticking up. But here you can look inside. Yeah, look at this. So we're coming down from the house now towards the mine. So we're gonna head for the mine. Uh, Terry has her metal detector today. Uh, wherever, wherever there's human activity, be it logging or mining or farming, people always sit down to take a break. And very often we find what's called a spill. Someone sits on the ground, the coins literally spill from their pocket. Mm. And we found, you know, four, five, six coins in a pile. So there is remnants of a road here, but off to the side here, there is a clearing that I think, we think might lead to the mine head. So there's definitely some bushwhacking involved here, but Morgan thinks we're close. Actually, there. what is this right here? Oh, holy cow, look at this. This was a horizontally dug mine shaft that followed a lead vein. Goes in about 150 feet, pitch black. Might be a little swampy, a little muddy. There's like big blood red stains on the rock. Awesome. All right, I'm going in, guys. I'm pointing the camera forward. Yeah, there's a lot of detritus in here, a lot of logs. I think people have probably thrown these in here to get through this mud. Thankfully, we've been in like a three month long drought here in New England, but it's still pretty muddy. I can feel it underneath my feet. So walk on the rocks whenever you can. But now it is about five feet tall, enough for me to hunch over, but not stand up all the way. It just keeps going and going. All of this was hand dug in the mid 1800s, I wanna say, maybe even early 1800s. This part of town was called Little Egypt. And I think right here we might be getting towards the end. Oh yeah, look at this. So this was a lead mine. I'm not sure if that's what these bright speckly things are. They can kind of see in the camera, but it's kind of all throughout the rock. 
very dark. I don't have like a mask or anything, but I'm not too worried. But look at these insects right here. There's some kind of cricket. Let me try to get better light. Yeah, you see these guys? They're alive. So this stuff right here, this highly polished, my friend here calls it miner's blood. I'm not sure what exactly causes it. It's like the early formations of stalactites, I guess. So like I said, it is pitch black in here if you don't have light. It's, it kind of goes in straight 150 feet, but it goes around enough turns that no light comes through. You might want to bring a helmet if you're coming in here because it's only about five and a half feet tall. Not enough space for a full-size adult to stand up and very muddy. I wish I brought mud boots, but this is very spooky, very cool. This has to be one of, if not the most, hidden off the beaten path places. I would, never would have found this. Like I said, you had to bushwhack to it for about the last quarter of a mile from an old road, an old Jeep road that probably hasn't been maintained in 60 years. But thankfully I have great tour guides. I never would have found this place if it weren't for these two, Terry and Morgan. They're like a gold mine. There's so much cool hidden stuff out here in the Berkshire, so much history in Western Mass, all of Mass really. Unfortunately, now I need to start the drive back to Boston. Yeah, I'm gonna try to hit one or two more cool things along the way though. Not too far from that lead mine is something really unique in a holly mass. It's called the Beehive Kiln. It's actually the oldest surviving charcoal kiln in New England, built around 1870, right here in the Kenneth Dubuque State Forest. This thing is 25 feet tall. It's called a beehive kiln. It was used to make charcoal. Charcoal is just wood that's been slowly burned over several days to get rid of all the moisture and impurities. So what's left over burns really hot, like 4,800 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead. This thing, like I said, was built in 1870. The way it works is they could stack up to 35 cords of wood in here. They would start a fire at this upper level. It would slowly burn down and all the moisture would get sucked out through these holes in the side. They call them draft holes. After about three or four days, they would put out the fire, take the cords out, and it would just be this blackened, but not completely burned wood. That's how charcoal is made. Like I said, this is the oldest surviving one in New England, right here in Hawley. This is actually on the National Register of Historic Places. You can go inside it. I am on my way back to Boston, unfortunately. I was looking for a place to pull over shoot the sunset along the way, I saw something called the Kmart Overlook in Lemonster. Not sure why it's called that. Not sure what the view is like. Maybe it's a view of Kmart or from Kmart. We'll find out together. Unfortunately, this is one of those places where Google Maps does not take you to the right place. I lost precious time trying to find the actual trailhead for this Kmart Overlook. The sun has already set. There's some beautiful pink light behind, pink light behind me. Beautiful mansions here. I'm talking like Nick Mansions, you know what I mean? I'm still gonna try to get up there. I think it's a half mile hike to the summit. Probably be hiking back down in the dark. Here's the path here, right next to this giant water tower thing. Here we go. Oh wow, this is actually quite beautiful. Well, I found out why this is called the Kmart Overlook. Originally, this was called the Monhusik Overlook by the Native Americans that were here. I think the Nipmuc tribe, the Monhusik Overlook, known as that for hundreds of years until the 1960s when they built a Kmart in that big box plaza below. Well, over the course of a few generations, this overlook, which is quite visible from that plaza, and has a great view of it. The locals just came to know it as the Kmart Overlook and the name just kind of stuck. The Kmart is actually no longer there. It's something else now. I think the Kmart disappeared like 20 years ago. It's still called the Kmart Overlook, unfortunately. I'm gonna do the Nipmuc a favor and make sure this is called the Monhusik Overlook 
in my description of this video. Also, this trail is six miles out and back and 600 feet of elevation gain, which is like climbing the tallest mountain in Florida three times over, which I did. It's kind of a more significant hike than I expected. I just saw this on Google Maps. I didn't do any research. Unfortunately, this is gonna be the end of my weekend full of adventure. From here, this video is gonna end right back where it started. I'm going back to Boston tonight. I'll be stealthing somewhere. I'm gonna be hiking down in the dark. I don't think I'm gonna film that or do like a chat from the van tonight. I kinda of wanna, I wanna keep that to myself. So I'm gonna end the video here. Thanks for following this weekend full of adventure. I did some cool stuff. Hit that like button below. I'll be back for more in a couple of days. Thanks for watching. Peace out.